Welcome to topic two of this CSS full course, CSS text. In this topic, we'll cover the key aspects of text design, including text styling, spacing, size, font selection, and color, while also beginning to develop a style guide. Don't forget that all complete HTML and CSS coding files, presentation slides, and summary cards from this topic and all the other topics in the full course can be downloaded from the description below. Let's begin by exploring how to transform the appearance of text through various techniques of text styling. We'll be discussing font weight, text decoration, font style, text transform, and list style. Throughout this topic, we're going to be taking a look at a range of text properties. I've broken these down into five categories. The first is styling, the second is spacing, and both of these categories have a mix of a few properties. The third one is family, which is about fonts. The fourth one is color, and the fifth one is size. When it comes to color and size, there is a bit more theory involved that applies throughout CSS. So in this chapter, we're focusing on text styling. The first styling property we're going to look at is font weight. It sets the thickness of text characters. Over here, font hyphen weight is the property, and bold is the value. For all the CSS properties I'm going to introduce, below it I'm going to show the values we can use with some notes. For font weight, although we can use name values like bold or normal, it's more common to use numerical values, which range from 100 to 900 in increments of hundreds. Looking at some important values, 400 is considered normal, 500 is medium thickness, and 700 is bold. Normal, which is 400, is the default weight for most text, whereas 700 is the default for headings. When I say default, what I mean is that if we didn't apply any font weight styling, the default for most text would be 400, and the default for headings is 700. As you increase the font weight value, you make your text look bolder. Let's jump into VS Code and play around with this. Inside VS Code, I'm going to go create a new HTML file. I'm going to click New File over here, select Text File, click Select a Language, search for HTML, and hit Enter. I'll straight away grab the boilerplate code by hitting exclamation mark Enter, and then I'm going to save the file by hitting Command S. I'm going to go on my desktop, and I'm going to create a new folder called Text Styling. I'll save this HTML file in this folder, and I'll call the file text-styling. I'm going to grab some placeholder text from my favorite placeholder text generator, Hipster Ipsum. I'm just going to copy this first sentence. I'm just going to paste the text over here for now. I'm going to add an H1 element, cut this, and put it inside the H1. I'll then create an H2, and add this text inside the H2. And then finally, let's add a paragraph tag, and I'll pop that text in there. So without adding any CSS, Let's go check out the default font weight. So you can see that our headings look more bold because they have a default weight of 700. And our paragraph has just a normal font weight of 400. So let's go change the font weights of these elements. So let's go and create a new CSS file and connect it to this HTML document. I'm going to hit Command N on my Mac to open a new tab. I'm then going to select a language and search for CSS. I'm then going to immediately save it by hitting Command S, and inside the same text styling folder, I'm going to call it app.css. Let's now go and connect the CSS file to the HTML file, like we saw in the introduction topic. All we do is we go get the link tag, the value stylesheet for rel comes pre-populated and is correct for CSS stylesheets, and the href is just app.css. Because app.css lives inside the same folder and is on the same level as text styling HTML, we just reference it like this. So let's go and style these now. For the h1, I'm going to give it a font weight of 400. This is actually the default weight for the paragraph, so it's going to look a lot thinner. I'm not going to style the h2 because I want to keep it there as a reference to compare it to the h1. For the paragraph, I'm going to give this a font weight of 700. 
which was the default weight for a heading. So I've actually swapped the weights for headings and paragraphs. Let's take a look at this in the browser. So you can see our H1 now looks a lot thinner. The default heading thickness was over here at 700. And the paragraph, which looked a lot thinner before, now has a font weight of 700. It's the same as the default H2 paragraph thickness. Now, throughout the CSS section, for any property I introduce, I'm going to provide design guidance. I am pretty proud of adding this to my CSS section, and trust me, it's been a lot of work. Most of the courses I've seen don't do this. They'll just show you the properties and move on. But I think without any proper design guidance, it is so confusing to know how to actually use the properties effectively. So let's look at font weight guidance. Typically, headings should be between 500 to 900, while other text should range from 300 to 400. For instance, let's check out this web page. The font weight for the heading is set to 600. And for the paragraph, it's 300. You can see the bolder heading is able to draw your attention, which is the effect we want to see. Let's look at another example. On this web page, the heading font weight is set at 500. And for the paragraph, it's 400. You can see this is another approach with values closer together, but it still works and falls within my suggested range for font weight, the heading, and other text. In our final example, notice how bold this heading looks. Compared to the earlier examples, this one really stands out. That's because the font weight for the heading is 900, while the paragraph is at 400. The next property we'll look at is text decoration. This property sets decorative lines on text. Text hyphen decoration is the property. And in this example, underline is the value. It's called the line value, as we're going to be adding other values soon. So we need to distinguish it from the other ones. Line values include line through, underline, overline, and none. The value none is the default for most elements, which means most elements do not have any text decoration. However, underline is the default for anchor elements. We've seen this already, where the hyperlinks we've created always have an underline by default. We can also give our text decoration a color. So for example, blue, which is the color value. This value is simply added by putting a space after the line value. Color values can be named, hex, or RGB. Named colors are ones we've worked with so far like green, blue, and yellow. There are other formats of color, like hex and RGB. Don't worry about colors at all for now. We're going to be discussing this later on in this topic. And for now, we're just gonna use the simple named colors. We can also add a style of the line, like dotted. And this is the style value. Other style values include double, dotted, wavy, solid, and dashed. If you don't specify a style value, and just made this example underline and blue, the default value will be solid. And we've seen this in anchor tags as well. Let's jump into VS Code and play around with this. I'm back in our text styling HTML file. For this demonstration, I also wanna add an anchor tag. So I'm just gonna copy some of this text and remove it from the paragraph and add an anchor tag with that text. For now, the href value really doesn't matter. I'm just gonna point it to Google. Back in the app.css file, I'm going to remove these styles we added before. For the h1, let's go grab the text decoration property. We'll make the line value underline. Let's give it a color of red, and let's make it wavy. For the h2, I'll grab text decoration. Let's give it a line value of line through, a color of green, and a style of dashed. For the paragraph, we'll get text decoration again. We'll give it a line value of overline, a color of blue. And this time I'm actually going to leave off the style value to demonstrate that by default, this line will be solid. That is a blue overline will appear that isn't styled in any fancy way, like being dashed or wavy. For the anchor tag, I'm gonna grab text decoration. And this time I'm just gonna set the value to none. I want to remove the default underline that appears there. Let's take a look at this in the browser. All right, we can see some fairly crazy stuff going on here. The H1 has an underline, so it's under the text. It's red, and you can see it's wavy. For the H2, the line is going through the text because of the line through value. It's green, and you can see the style of the line is dashed. 
For the paragraph, it's an overline, so it appears above the text, and it's blue. And because I left off a style value, it defaults to just a solid line. There's no particular styling, like being wavy or dashed. And for the anchor tag, you can see there's no longer an underline here. We removed it with the CSS rule, text decoration none. If I delete this and save and refresh, you can see by default, we've got the underline back on our anchor tag. So let's now take a look at some text decoration guidance. We should always remove underline from anchor tags and very rarely use text decoration. On this web page, you'll notice the anchor tags here have no text decoration. And I'd highly recommend that instead of using text decoration to style text, it's a much better idea to style your text like you see it here, where we're styling with weight and color instead. I generally recommend steering clear of using text decoration for styling purposes, except for removing it from anchor text. Text decoration reminds me a lot of Internet Explorer. There's a ton of memes about how the whole purpose of Internet Explorer is just to download Chrome, like this one over here. It's the same with text decoration. Its main purpose is just to remove itself. The next property we're looking at is font style. This property sets the style of a font. Over here, font hyphen style is the property. And in this example, italic is the value. The values we can use are normal, italic, oblique, and oblique at a specific angle, like oblique 10 degrees. The default value for font style is normal, meaning by default, no special font styling is applied to our HTML elements. Let's go play around with this in VS Code. I'm back inside our textstyling.html file. I'm gonna head over to the CSS file, and I'm gonna delete all the styling from before. For the H1, we'll grab the font style property and set it to italic. For the H2, we'll grab the font style property and set that to oblique. And for the paragraph, I'll grab the font style property and I'll set this to oblique with an angle of 30 degrees. Let's check this out in the browser. So looking in the browser, you can see the H1 is now in italic. The text slants to the right, but the H2, which is set to oblique, and the paragraph, which is set to oblique with an angle, kind of looks the same. And the truth is, the visual differences between italic and oblique can be subtle and may not even be noticeable in many fonts. So what is the difference between italic and oblique? Italic is a purpose-built font. For example, in Microsoft Word, you can select your font to be italic, which is actually selecting a specific variation of the font. Whereas oblique will take the regular font and just slant it to the right. It's not a purpose-built font. It's applying rules to an existing regular font. And that's why these basically look the same. The differences can be subtle. And to be honest, I really wouldn't worry about any of this. The nuanced differences between them concerns the print industry a lot more than web developers. So if you ever want to use this property, I suggest just using italic. Let's now take a look at some font style guidance. Font style can sometimes be useful to draw attention. In this example, you can see the words in half is in italic. To emphasize the fact, you can cut your publishing time in half. Once again, personally, I prefer using weight and color to draw attention. And I suggest you also do the same. Next up, we're going to look at text transform. This property sets the capitalization of text. Over here, we can see text hyphen transform is the property and uppercase is the value. The values for this property include none, uppercase, lowercase, and capitalize. None is the default value, which means text will just appear exactly how you typed it in your HTML document. Uppercase turns all letters into uppercase, lowercase turns all letters into lowercase, and capitalize means the first letter of each word is capitalized. Let's go play around with this in VS Code. I'm back inside our text styling HTML file and its corresponding style sheet. For the H1, I'm gonna remove this, add text transform, and let's add the value uppercase. For the heading two, I'll remove this and go grab the text transform property and set it to lowercase. And for the paragraph, let's remove this, grab the text transform property and set the value to capitalize. Now, just before we look at this in the browser, 
I want to go put a capital in our H2, just so you can properly see the effect of setting it all to lowercase. So let's now check this out in the browser. You can see with our heading one, every single letter is now in uppercase. With our H2, every single letter is now lowercase. And with the paragraph, the first letter of every word is capitalized. Let's look now at text transform guidance. It's best to stick with sentence case. Sentence case means the first letter of the first word in a sentence is uppercase. So this is just achieved by typing it that way in your HTML, instead of applying the text transform property. In this example, you can see sentence case being used for both the heading and paragraph, where the first letter of the first word in a sentence is capitalized. The T in the, for the recruitment software your candidates and team will love, and the J in join, where the rest of the letters in the paragraph are all lowercase. What you will see is bloggers, edgy brands, and studios will sometimes use uppercase to create a larger visual impact and appear more daring. Here's a studio example where everything in the heading is in uppercase, which creates a huge visual impact. However, for most applications you're likely going to be working on, sticking with sentence case is usually the safer choice. The last property we will look at is list style. As the name suggests, list style sets the style of a list. Here we can see list hyphen style, which is the property. And in this example, disk is the value. The values we can have include none, disk, circle, square, and decimal. Disk is the default for unordered lists. As you've seen, the bullets are always a solid black fill or disk. Decimal is the default for ordered lists, which are integers that increment by one for each list item. Let's go play around in VS Code. I'm back inside the text styling HTML file. Inside the body, I'm gonna go create an unordered list. I'll add three list items by typing li times three. And I'm just gonna cut this text and remove the elements. And I'll also get rid of the anchor tag. We don't need it anymore. Let's head to app CSS. I'm gonna delete all those CSS rules. Let's go and change the list style of the unordered list. I'll grab the unordered list by typing ul. We'll get the list style property by typing list style. We know by default it's disk, so let's change it to square. Let's check this out in the browser. So you can see now that our bullet points are no longer a circle fill, they're a black square. Let's change them to circle to see what that looks like. And now they become a circle with no fill and a black border. The last one I want to show you is changing it to none. This removes the bullet points entirely. So let's look at some list style guidance. We should always set list style to none when they are used for structural purposes. This is going to be the most common use case you are going to have for the list style property simply using it to remove the default behavior, similar to how we use text decoration to remove the underline from anchor tags. In this example, this navigation bar is built with an unordered list with list styling removed. The unordered list is being used here for structural purposes to nicely group the menu items together. So let's finish up by building a summary card for this chapter, text styling. We first looked at font weight. The CSS property looked like this, and the values ranged from 100 to 900 in increments of hundreds. The default values include 400 for most text and 700 for headings. And the design guidance is that headings should be 500 to 900 and other text 300 to 400. We looked at font style, where the CSS property looked like this, and the values include normal, italic, oblique, and oblique with an angle and we saw that normal was the default property. The design guidance for font style was avoid using. For list style, the CSS property looks like this, and we saw there were five values, none, disk, circle, square, and decimal. Disk is the default value for unordered lists, and decimal is the default value for ordered lists. The design guidance we saw was that we should remove list styling. We also saw text decoration, where the CSS property looks like this, and there were three values. The first was the line value, then the color value, and then the style value. 
Line values include none, line through, underline, and overline, where none is the default property. For color values, you can use name colors, like we've done here with blue, or RGB or hex values, which we'll be talking about soon. And for the style value, values include double, solid, dotted, dashed, and wavy. For the design guidance, we saw we should remove underline from anchor tags. The last property we looked at was text transform, and it looks like this, where there are four values, none, uppercase, lowercase, and capitalize, where none was the default value. The design guidance was use sentence case in HTML. Okay, so it's time to start adding CSS to the major Quill project we've been working on. Let's have a look at where we got up to at the end of the HTML section. I'm just going to scroll down the page so you can see all the content. By the end of the CSS section, our web page will look like this. And as you can see, CSS really adds visual identity to the page. So let's jump into VS Code and take a look where we got up to in the HTML section. So here's our Quill project. We mainly worked on the index.html file. And this is the document we'll be styling with CSS. We also created a placeholder login page and a placeholder register page, as well as the create journal form. And then we also have a series of images, both PNGs and SVGs that are being used on the index page. Now, if this is your first time joining me, I provided a link in the description below where you can download these files. And if you don't know anything about HTML, you're better off taking the HTML course first because to properly work with CSS, you do need a solid understanding in HTML. You can take my full HTML course by clicking the link appearing in the top right now. All right, so the first thing we need to do before we get started is add a style sheet and connect it to the index.html file. To do that, I'm gonna come over here into our working directory, click new file, and create a new CSS file called app.css. Now in order for the styles to apply to our index page, we need to link it. I generally like linking my style sheet above the title. I'll grab the link attribute, the rel style sheet becomes pre-populated, and the value style sheet is correct, and the href is going to point to our style sheet, which is in the same level as our working directory, so it's just app.css. So let's go and add some text styling properties we've just learned about. We'll start by adding font weight to the home page. We're going to be setting the headings to a font weight of 700, while other text content and paragraphs will be set to 400. Again, the headings over here will be set to 700, and the paragraph text 400. And at the bottom of the page, this heading will be 700, and the rest of the text will all be 400. So let's jump into VS Code and add this to our project. So let's go and add the font weight for our headings. We'll start with an H1, which will have a font weight of 700. The H2, will also have a font weight of 700. And same with the H3, a font weight of 700. We'll then set our paragraph to have a font weight of 400. And the final element we have on our page is an anchor tag. And we'll set the font weight of that to also be 400. Now, you may be thinking, why am I even setting these weights? The default value for all headings is already 700. And for other text, it's 400. This is just best practice to explicitly set the font weight. It could also be that later on in your project, you want to change this. So it's generally a good idea to always set the font weight, even if at the beginning, it's the same as the default. Looking at this in the browser, we see no change, which makes sense because our font weight values, the headings and other text is the same as the default values. The next property we'll be using is text decoration. All we're gonna do is go to our anchor tag over here, grab the text decoration property, and put none as the value. Let's check this out in the browser. You can now see that the underlines on our hyperlinks have been removed. We can see that over here, over here, over here, and these ones over here. That's generally all we do with text decoration. Just remove them from the anchor tags. The next property we'll be discussing is text transform. As we discussed in the design guidance earlier, it's generally best practice to use sentence case. So in fact, we're not gonna change anything because I've written my text in sentence case. For example, this paragraph, only the first letter of the first word is uppercase. 
I have noticed there are a few places that I haven't done this, so I want to correct those now so that everything is consistent. This get started, I'm going to put that in lowercase. The more, I'm going to put that in lowercase. The h2 get started now. I also want to put these letters in lowercase. And the anchor text here, the s in started, I also want to put in lowercase. So this should all be consistent now with everything in sentence case. I'm not going to be applying any text transform property. I've set it how I want to, just by how I've written the HTML. The last text styling property we will be using is list style, in order to remove the bullet points, which are acting as structural units. You can see we have these annoying bullet points, like next to our links over here, and also down the bottom here, with our social media icons, as well as these links. So let's go and remove those now. I'm back inside the Quill project. In the style sheet, I'm going to go grab the unordered list. I'm going to find the list style property and I'm going to set it to none. So let's check this out in the browser. So you can see now those bullet points have been removed for these links, as well as down here on our social media icons. Next up, we'll learn how to control the spacing and alignment of text to improve readability with text spacing. We'll be looking at text align, line height, and letter spacing. So in the previous chapter, I introduced these five categories of text properties in CSS, including styling, spacing, family, color, and size. In this chapter, we're going to focus on text spacing, which like styling also has a few important properties we need to look at. The first property we're going to discuss is text align. This property specifies the horizontal alignment of text within an element. You can see here, text hyphen align is the property. And in this case, center is the value. There are four text align values, which are left, right, center, and justify. The default value is left, meaning if we don't specify any text align property, our HTML elements will align left, which we've seen so far whenever we've written our HTML. It always starts at the left edge of the page. Left align is generally considered easier to read for paragraphs of text. For longer chunks of text, it's advisable to either use text align left or not specify it at all, since it aligns left by default. Center alignment is often used for headings and shorter pieces of text. If you set justify as the value, every line in a paragraph takes up the full width of a containing box. Now, before we go play around with this in VS Code, I want to dive into something incredibly important about text align, and that is the different behavior when applied to block and inline elements. Let's look at a block element first. As you know, with a block element, the box spans the entire width of the page, which allows text align to significantly affect the placement of text. For instance, I have the text here playing with CSS, which is an H1 element, and by default will initially be aligned to the left. As an H1 is a block element, its box will take up the full width of the page. If I apply text align as right, the text will move to the right inside the box. So you can see the text can move right because it is a block element. The box extends the full width of the page. Let's compare this to inline elements. As we know, inline elements only take up the horizontal space that they need. In this example, I have a hyperlink with the text link, which is an anchor element. And as we know, anchor elements only take up the space they need. Because of this, there is no space for the text to move because the box is only as big as the content itself. So if I try to apply text align right to this element, it won't have any impact. When we first started the CSS topic, I mentioned the importance from the outset of being able to distinguish between block and inline elements in CSS, as styling can be heavily influenced by whether an element you are styling is block or inline. And here is a perfect example of that. Let's now go play around in VS Code. Inside VS Code, I'm going to go create a new HTML and CSS file. I'll start with the HTML file by clicking New File, selecting Text File, click Select a Language, and search for HTML. I'll grab the boilerplate code by hitting exclamation mark Enter. I'll straight away save the file. On my Mac, I'm clicking Command S. I'll go to the desktop and I'll create a new folder called text spacing. And I'll call this HTML file text 
hyphen spacing. Let's go add the CSS file. I'll hit Command N to open a new tab. I'll click Select a Language, search CSS, and hit Enter. I'll save this by hitting Command S. And inside the same text spacing folder, I'll save this as app.css. Let's now go and link the CSS file to the HTML file. Inside the head tag, I grab the link element. And as app.css is in the same directory as our HTML file on the same level, we can just reference it with app.css. All right, for this example, I want to go grab three H2s. And I'm just copying in some placeholder text from my favorite tool, Hipster Ipsum. I'm also going to add a paragraph tag with a much chunkier piece of text. And the last element I want to add is an anchor tag. I'll just set the href value as the Google homepage. Now, a really helpful trick I want to show you, which makes working with HTML and CSS more productive, is splitting the visual code window into two. And the way we do that is we grab the other file like this and move it to the right. This now gives us our HTML on the left and our CSS on the right. And we can see both of them at the same time. And sorry, just a minor error I picked up on. This should have been an H3 and this should have been an H4. So let's now go and style these with the text align property. For the H2, I'm going to set text align to be left, which is just the default value. So we shouldn't see any change there. For the H3, I'm going to set the text align value to be center. And for the H4, I'll set the text align value to be right. For the paragraph, I'm going to set the text align value to justify. And for the anchor tag, I'm going to set text align to center. So let's check these out in the browser. So you can see, as expected, our H2 is aligned left, which is just the default value. So there's no visible change here. The H3 has been centered on the page. The H4 is now on the right of the page. The paragraph text is justified, where every line takes up the full width of the page, which means that the spacing in the lines can be different. For example, on this line here, there's much fewer words than elsewhere, so the spacing is much larger. Compared to this line here, where there's a lot of words, the spacing is smaller. And finally, we can see no effect of applying text align center onto our anchor tag. And that's because it's an inline element. If I open up the dev tools by right clicking inspect, I can go and select the different elements. For the headings, you can see the invisible box and how it extends the full width of the page, allowing space for the content inside of it to center or move to the right. Whereas for the anchor tag, the box takes up the width of the content, so there is no space for the anchor tag to move. And as we know, an anchor tag is an inline element. Let's now take a look at some text align guidance. Don't justify text. Long blocks of text should be left aligned and do not center large blocks of text. On this web page, we can see that both the heading and paragraphs are centered, which appears visually attractive. This kind of styling is a common practice, but note that these pieces of text are not long and typically only extend a couple of lines. Let's look at another example. In this case, both the heading and paragraph are aligned left. Aligning the heading and paragraph to the left also presents a neat appearance. And it is especially common to do this when there's an image on the right, like we see here. Centering text with an image beside it wouldn't look so good. However, it's important to note that just because we've aligned left this heading and paragraph doesn't mean we need to do that throughout the page. As you can see below, we have a heading over here that is centered. The next property we're going to look at is line height. Line height sets the height of text and is commonly used to set the distance between multiple lines of text. Here we can see line hyphen height, which is the property. And in this example, it's set to 1.5, which is the value. We can use several types of values for the line height property, such as a unitless value, pixels, percentages, and m's. Unitless is just a number that multiplies the font size and is commonly used for line height. There are other units that you can use, but we will explore these in more detail later on, as units is a topic in itself. Don't worry about these for now. It isn't common to use them for line height anyway. So let's go play around with this in VS Code. So I'm back in our text spacing HTML file. I'll keep this H2 element, 
but I'm going to get rid of the h3 and h4, as well as the anchor tag. So we're just left with a heading 2 and paragraph. I'm going to pop the app CSS file on the right. I'll delete all these styles. And let's grab the h2 and give it a line height of 3. For the paragraph, we'll grab line height and give it a value of 4. So let's check this out in the browser. So let's look at the heading first. If I try select it, you can see the blue box vertically is quite a bit bigger. And that's the impact of line height. However, because it's just one line, we can't really see the effect of spacing between lines. With the paragraph, we can. We can see how spaced out each line is. If I make this a smaller value, like 2, you'll see how the lines are much closer together. So the real impact of line height is when we have multiple lines of text. Let's discuss some line height guidance. Headings should always be less than 1.5 and regular text between 1.5 to 2 to improve readability. As you can see here, this heading is assigned a numerical value of 1.2 for line height, which is below 1.5. This creates space between each line, making the heading a bit more readable as it slightly separates the lines of text. However, for smaller text like a paragraph over here, it's recommended to use a line height value between 1.5 and 2. In this example, a numerical value of 1.6 is used to enhance readability. We typically use a larger value of line height for smaller text like paragraphs compared to headings, as paragraphs usually have smaller font size, so require more line height to improve readability on multiple lines. In this example, the line height value for this heading is set to 1.5, which in my opinion is pushing the line height to the limit. You might notice it starts to look a bit odd, as if the lines of text are somewhat disconnected. That's the reason why we shouldn't set the line height value above 1.5 for headings. This is just a demonstration of how text appears when it's on the edge cases, and the lines of text begin to appear excessively spaced out. Moving on to the last spacing property we will look at in this chapter, which is letter spacing. Letter spacing sets the horizontal space between characters. Letter hyphen spacing is the property, and in this example, 8 pixels is the value. Values we can apply to the letter spacing property include pixels, percentages, and ends. Pixels are the most commonly used type of value for letter spacing. We're going to talk about what pixels are soon, but just for now, understand that a pixel is just a small unit, and it's likely something you've heard about before. Keep in mind, we will discuss percentages and M values later on. Also note that for letter spacing, there is no unitless value, like there was for line height we saw previously, meaning we can't simply have a number multiplied by the text. Let's go play around with letter spacing in VS Code. I'm back inside our textspacing.html file, and corresponding app.css file. I'm going to remove this styling. I'm going to go grab the h2 again. We'll get the letter spacing property. And I'm going to add a value of 10 pixels. Let's check this out in the browser. You can see this looks terrible. Because I've added a positive value, it's creating space between each letter, which makes it really hard to read, as letters are disconnected from one another. Let's now look at some letter spacing guidance. We often apply a small negative pixel value to headings to improve readability. This technique brings letters closer together and is known as tightening. In this example, the heading is set with a negative 3.6 pixel value, making the letters a bit closer to each other, which improves the readability, as larger texts like headings will have their letters more spread out, which would look disconnected. So applying a slight negative pixel value tightens the heading and improves the readability. So let's finish out by starting to build the summary card, text spacing and size. We first looked at text align. The CSS property looked like this. And we saw there were four values, left, right, center, and justify, where left was the default value. The design guidance we saw was that you can use center, but left align should be used for blocks of text. We then looked at line height, where the CSS property looked like this. The units we can use for the value include unitless, pixels, percentages, and Ms. We mentioned we're going to be talking about units in a later topic. 
And for line height, it's most common to use unitless values, like 1.5 shown above, which multiplies the font size by 1.5. The design guidance we saw was that headings should be less than 1.5, and regular text should have a line height value of 1.5 to 2. The final property we looked at was letter spacing, and it looked like this. Values we can use here include pixels, percentages, and m's. And we noted that you can't use unitless values like you can for line height. For letter spacing, the most common unit to use is pixels. And the design guidance we saw was that small negative values are applied to headings to tighten up the text. OK, so let's go ahead and add some of the text spacing properties we've just learned about to the Quill homepage. We'll start off with the CSS property text align. At the top of the page, we've aligned both our heading and paragraph text in the center, which makes sense to do because there's no surrounding assets like an image to cater for. Scrolling down the page, we've also center aligned this heading. However, you can see that for each feature, both the heading and paragraph are aligned left. This looks good because we need to cater for the image on the right. So let's now go and add text align on the Quill project in VS Code. So I'm back inside the Quill project. I have my HTML file here on the left and my CSS file here on the right. We know that for our H1, we want this to be centered. So I'm going to come over here in our CSS, type text align, and set that to center. The H2s are also centered, so I'm going to set text align to center. And the H3s were all aligned left, which is the default value, so I'm not going to touch those. Now, with our paragraph, we have a slight problem. Because some of our paragraph text is centered, like in the main hero section below the main heading, where other times it's aligned left, like for each feature in the features section. Now, we're just at the beginning of our CSS journey, so there's not much we can do about this at this point. In the next topic, we're going to be learning about different selectors and the concept of inheritance. And once we've understood that, we'll be able to implement a solution. With the anchor tags, at this point, applying text align center would also have no effect because an anchor tag is an inline element. So we're not going to apply anything here. So let's check this out in the browser. OK, so this did have quite an impact on the visual styling. Our main heading is nicely centered now. And our H2s, which are the section headings, like this one over here and this one over here, are also now centered. Now that we've applied the text align property, Let's have a look at applying the line height property. For our headings, we're going to be applying a line height value of 1.2. And for the paragraph text, we're going to be setting a line height value of 1.5. The impact of line height won't be seen for this particular paragraph because it's a single line. However, we will see the effect for other paragraphs down the page. Scrolling down, both the section heading and the features heading will have the same line height of 1.2. And as we saw before, the paragraph text has a value of 1.5. The effect of applying line height on this paragraph will now be seen because there are multiple lines. Let's jump into VS Code and add line height to our project. In the CSS file, for the headings, we have a line height of 1.2. I'm just going to copy this for the other headings because the value is the same. For the paragraph, we're using a line height with a value of 1.5. And I'm going to do the same for the anchor tag. Although it's not going to be common to have multiple lines on an anchor tag, so this effect won't really be seen. But I'm just adding it for the sake of completeness. So let's check this out in the browser. All right, we can see for our headings, we have a very slight line height over here when we have multiple lines of text. It's more obvious on paragraphs that span multiple lines, like this one here. The distance between each line has been slightly increased. The final CSS property we're going to be adding in this chapter to the Quill homepage is letter spacing. Across all of our headings, we're going to add a minus two pixel letter spacing value. As a result, each individual letter in the headings will come closer together and improve the readability. Let's go add letter spacing into the project in VS Code. So I'm back inside our project. In the app.css file, in the H1, I'm going to go grab the letter spacing property. And I'm going to set the value to minus two pixels. I'm then going to copy and paste this for heading two and heading three. So let's check this out in the browser. 
Now, as you can see, this looks fairly awful. The letters are now too close to each other. Later on in this topic, we're going to be changing the font. And when we update the font, this issue will auto-correct itself. So we're just going to have to live with it for now. Now it's time to dive into adjusting the size of text elements by looking at text size. We'll be discussing font size, pixels as a unit, and looking at what a type scale is. So again, here are all the text properties we will be looking at in this topic. So far we've covered text styling and spacing, and it's now time to look at size. It's important to understand that with sizing, there's a bit more theory involved that will apply throughout CSS. We're going to take a look at size in relation to text sizing, but keep in mind that the material we discuss is going to be applicable for other non-text properties we will look at later. So let's talk about font size. This property sets the size of the text. Over here, we can see we have font hyphen size, which is the property, and in this example, 16 pixels, which is the value. Now, when it comes to size units, there are two groups, absolute units and relative units. We're going to be covering units in a lot more detail later on. But here's a quick overview. Let's first look at absolute units. For absolute units, the size is fixed and does not change in relation to parent elements. Examples include pixels, points, inches, centimeters, and millimeters. The pixel is an absolute unit that is commonly used in CSS. And the other units you see here are uncommon. We're not going to use them. Point is a unit that's often used in printing. And inches, centimeters, and millimeters are units used in the real world. Most of the time, except for a few properties, we typically avoid using absolute units because they're static. Web pages are all about dynamic and adaptable designs that can fit different screen sizes and resolutions. Therefore, having a fixed size isn't ideal. So on the flip side, we have relative units. Relative units are where sizes are based on the size of a parent element and adjust proportionally to changes in the parent element. Now, that sentence can seem pretty confusing. The best way I can explain what this means is with this balloon. This balloon has an elastic band wrapped around it. I'm going to call the balloon the parent. It's the thing we're going to inflate. And the elastic band is the child. The size of the elastic band is dependent on the size of the balloon. So if we blew this balloon up, not only does the balloon expand, but the elastic band expands as well. So we can think about this with sizing of HTML elements, that when a parent is a certain size, the child will be a proportion of that size. Just like the elastic band going around the balloon is directly influenced by the size of the balloon. Examples of relative units are percentages, Ms, Rems, VH, and VW. They're great for web development because they help elements resize according to the parent's container's dimensions, giving flexibility across layouts and screen sizes. This is just a very basic introduction. Don't worry at all about these right now. I just wanted to provide a very soft introduction to them. And as I mentioned, we're going to spend an entire topic discussing them. For now, we're just going to be using the pixel. So let's discuss pixels in more detail. A pixel is a single point of light on a digital display. Here is a screen showing a pixel. It's essentially a tiny dot of color on the screen. So how big is a pixel? A CSS pixel has a length of 1 over 96 inches, or 0 0.0104 inch. In a nutshell, a pixel is small. So our pixel over here has a length of 0 0.0104 inches. If we applied the CSS rule font size as 10 pixels, it would mean that the size of the font would be 10 times this one pixel, which would be 0 0.104 inch. Now I need to add a big disclaimer at this point. The concept of pixel size is actually a bit more complicated than this, because in reality, different devices have different screen sizes and resolutions. At this point, do not worry about this fact. It is something we're going to be discussing a lot more in a later topic, and going into detail now would honestly just confuse you and be counterproductive. So let's now talk about some font size guidance. It's recommended that regular text should be 16 to 32 pixels, and headings can be greater than 60 pixels. Let's look at this web page here. 
The main heading has a font size of 72 pixels. It stands out nicely from the rest of the text. The paragraph text here is 18 pixels, fitting nicely between the 16 to 32 pixel range. Then we've got an anchor tag, which is 16 pixels, and a smaller anchor tag up here, which is 14 pixels. Scrolling down the page, we have a smaller heading here, which is 48 pixels, and an even smaller heading here, which is 24 pixels. As you can see, while some headings can exceed 60 pixels and be quite large, there is also scope to use smaller values less than 60 for smaller headings. Over here, we have some paragraph text, which is set at 16 pixels, slightly smaller than the other paragraph text we looked at before. Let's look at another example. The heading here has a font size of 75 pixels, which is really eye catching and big. The paragraph text is 28 pixels. What I want to highlight is that you've got some flexibility when it comes to choosing font sizes. There is no hard and fast rule that a heading or paragraph must be a specific font size. However, they should fall within the ranges I've provided. So let's talk about how we can help narrow down our choices for font sizing. You should use a type scale, which provides a structured hierarchy of font sizes to create visual consistency and limit choices. This is a fantastic tool, typescale.com. I've put a link in the description below and I'm gonna show you how it works. Over here on the left, we have criteria. The first is the body size. It's the base value that all our text sizes will be calculated from. Just leave this at 16. Scale is the factor we're multiplying our body size to to give us a range of other sizes. You can see that there are a range of different scales we can select, like 1.2, 1.250, etc. These names, minor third, major third, perfect fourth, etc., actually come from music theory. You don't really need to worry about the names, focus more on the numbers. Just to play around, I'm going to go select perfect fourth. You can see over here, it outputs us a range of different sizes that scale according to this scale factor. There's other criteria we can play with, like the font. For example, we're going to be using poppers, so I can change that. I can change the weight, line weight, letter spacing, colors, etc. On the far right here, if I expand this window, you can see what a typical web page would look like using this body size with this scale factor. So you can also play around here. In our Quill project, we're going to be using a major third, which is a scale factor of 1.25. We start with a base of 16 pixels. For each value, I'm gonna put some sample text so you can see what it looks like. 16 pixels is our base unit. So we then multiply that by 1.25, which gives us a value of 20 pixels. This is then repeated several times, where we get 24 pixels, 32 pixels, 40 pixels, 48 pixels, and 62 pixels. Now I am slightly rounding these numbers to make them a bit more user-friendly. So if you were to use the type scale tool and apply major third, your numbers would look a little bit different. I can also get smaller values by dividing by 1.25, which gives me 12 pixels. Next, we assign these specific sizes to HTML text elements. Starting at the top, I'll assign 62 pixels to an H1, 48 pixels to an H2, 40 pixels to an H3, and if we do need them later, 32 pixels to an H4, and 24 pixels to an H5. I've skipped over H6 as we don't need to go down that far. I'll assign 20 pixels to our paragraph, and 16 pixels will be our anchor tags. I'm also going to introduce small, which will be used for even smaller text, setting it at 12 pixels. Now note, this is not an HTML element like the others above it, but it's our own defined class, which we will be discussing in the next topic. Now, we could make our paragraph and anchor tags the same size, but I've chosen to keep the anchor tag slightly smaller. Hopefully you can see using a type scale helps provide a structure for helping you select font size. Now, of course, you have complete freedom to choose whatever values you like, and it is sometimes helpful to use a type scale and adapt the values for your own specific needs. So let's finish building our summary card, text spacing and size we looked at the font size property, which looked like this. 
Values you can use include pixels and rems, where pixels are an absolute value and rems are a relative value. We'll just be using pixels for now, and we have a whole topic dedicated to units later on in the course. The design guidance we saw was that regular text should be 16 pixels to 32 pixels, and headings can be greater than 60 pixels. We also looked at what a type scale was, where we start with the base unit, like 16 pixels, and then apply a scaling factor like 1.25 to give us the next value up, in this case, 20 pixels. We then continued this to get higher values. And then from these values, we attributed a particular HTML element. So let's go ahead and add some different font sizes to our Quill project. These are the different font sizes we defined earlier. We use the type scale to establish different font sizes for different elements. We're now going to be using these values inside our Quill project. Our heading one has a value of 62 pixels. Our paragraph, 20 pixels. And our anchor tags are all 16 pixels. Scrolling down the page, our H2 is sized at 48 pixels. Our H3 is set at 40 pixels. And just like before, the paragraph is 20 pixels. Moving down to the bottom of the page, this heading 2 also has a value of 48 pixels. The anchor tag has the same value as the other ones at 16 pixels. And the anchor tags down here is also 16 pixels. We also have this very small piece of text right at the bottom here. This is 12 pixels. It's that small value we saw and we'll be defining later in the next topic. So let's jump into VS Code and add all our font sizing. So I'm back inside the Quill project. I'm going to head to the app.css file, and we can start adding our different font sizing. Starting with the H1, I'm going to go grab font size and add the value of 62 pixels. For the H2, the font size value was 48 pixels. For the H3, the font size value was 40 pixels. Now, although we don't have an H4 or H5 yet, I am going to add them in case we want to use them later. So I'll grab H4, and this had a font size of 32 pixels. I'm also going to apply the other properties we've consistently applied to our headings, the font weight, line height, and letter spacing. For the H5, the font size was 24 pixels, and I'm just going to paste above those same settings. For our paragraph element, the font size was 20 pixels, and for our anchor tag, the font size was 16 pixels. Let's go check this out in the browser. So you can see adding font size makes a huge difference to our design. The H1 is looking nice and big here. The paragraph text is more readable. And the feature section pops a bit more, with a larger heading here and larger heading here. Scrolling down to the call to action section, the get started now is also nice and big. One major change that has also happened since we've now made our text a lot larger is that the letter spacing value of minus two pixels actually looks good, where the text is no longer too cramped. While the letters are still a bit on top of each other, it does look a lot better, and it will only improve when we add our own font to the Quill project soon. As you can see, font size is really important. It makes a huge visual difference to your web page. In the next chapter, we'll explore how to change the overall look and feel of your text by looking at text font. We'll be looking at typefaces, font family, and Google fonts. So far, we've looked at styling, spacing, and size. In this chapter, we will be discussing font family. Let's start by talking about a typeface. A typeface is just a fancy word for a specific font. A font features characters with consistent visual characteristics. Now, typefaces or fonts are organized into groups. The first group we have is serif. Serif fonts have extra details on the end of a stroke, which you can see on this font over here at the bottom of the T. A classic example of a serif font is Times. Next, we have sans serif. These fonts are known for their straight ends and are much cleaner. And they don't have those extra details like a serif font. Arial is an example of a sans serif font. Next up, we have monospace fonts. In this font, letters are the same width. This means each character takes up equal space, like you see over here. Kuroya Nyu is a good example of a monospace font. The next group are cursive fonts. 
Cursive fonts have joining strokes or mimic handwriting. Comic Sans MS is an example of a cursive font. The final group are display fonts. They are designed to be attention-grabbing and more artistic. Impact is a popular display font. Let's now explore each of these typeface groups and see how they're used in design. We'll first start with the serif typeface. Serif fonts are all about a classic feel used by brands to communicate luxury and reliability. Here's a great example. Patch is a more high-end plant company. I've previously complained about this company as they sell grossly overpriced plants because they have cute names like Susie and Big Ken. But I have to hand it to these guys, their branding is pretty slick. When you look at their heading, it's just got that vibe of being a bit more classy. Serif typefaces are a go-to for high-end products. Next up, we've got the Sans Serif typeface. It's a modern and clean feel used by brands to communicate simplicity and clarity. Take a look at this heading and paragraph text. It's clean and straightforward. Sans Serif fonts are a favorite among tech companies. Next is the Monospace typeface. Monospace typeface has a technical feel used by brands to communicate accuracy and precision. This is a good example of using a monospace font. It's typically picked for very technical products. This company is quite techy, so they've used monospace to really drive home the vibe of scientific precision and accuracy. Moving on to cursive typeface. This one's all about creating a personal feel, which is used to connect with people on a more emotional level. The text here is cursive, which is super popular for things like weddings and blogs. It brings that personal touch used to evoke heartfelt emotions for an event like a wedding. Finally, we have the display typeface. It's a creative feel used by brands to communicate playfulness and rule breaking. This company sells CBD gummies, so it's a bit more of an edgy product. So a display font is a good choice. Display fonts are commonly used by fun brands, bringing a bold and lively vibe to the table. All right, so let's look at the font family CSS property. Font family in CSS sets a prioritized list of font names, typefaces, or font categories. Let's take a look at this. On the left, we have the CSS property, which is font hyphen family. In our example, the value to Homer is used, which is a sans serif font. And this is our first choice. This is then followed by a font group, sans serif, which is our fallback option. So why do we need a fallback option? The reason behind this is that fonts will only display in your browser if they are installed on your machine. So for example, the font to Homer is installed on 99.9% .9 of Windows machines. However, on Mac, it is installed on only 91.7%. There's a chance that if you're viewing a web page on a Mac and to Homer isn't installed, it won't show up. That's where our fallback comes into play. The fallback is set as a generic font group, like sans serif, which ensures a font group that you do want will be found and displayed. So what sans serif font will be applied? This also depends on your operating system. On a Mac, the default sans serif font is Helvetica, while on a Windows, it's Arial. Let's look at an opposite example. Futura is on 1.3% of Windows and 94.4% on Mac. So you can see the fallback option is really important for ensuring font visibility across different platforms. Now you can add more fonts to the comma separated prioritized list, but you should always end with a font group as opposed to a specific font to ensure a backup font from a group you prefer will always be selected. At this point, I also want you to note that when we provide a single font value, it's in commas, whereas a font group is not. So let's jump into VS Code and check this out. All right, so I've set up a new folder called font-family, and inside it, I have an index.html file where I've grabbed the boilerplate, and I've also linked a style sheet called app.css, which is currently empty. So inside index.html, I'm just gonna go add an h1, and let's just give it the text, this is a heading. So let's head over to app.css. I'm gonna select the h1. I'll grab the font-family property and make my first choice impact. Now, because I'm on a Mac, there's a 95% chance this font is installed on my device. I'll then go give a backup font of sans serif. And just a reminder, the specific fonts that you select 
should be in commas, whereas a font group is not. So let's check this out in the browser. So you can see that our heading is looking very different to how it usually looks. Just a reminder of what it usually looks like, I'm going to comment out this H1, save and refresh, and you can see this is the default font you're used to seeing. I'm just going to go back and uncomment this. So the impact font is being applied, and we can actually confirm this in DevTools. I'll right click Inspect. Now, in the HTML section of the course, we spent a lot of time on the Elements tab, specifically on the left here, where it showed us the full markup of the page. In the CSS section, we're going to be spending a lot of time on the right here, as this shows all the CSS rules that are applied to the page. If I grab the Inspection tool and select the H1, you can see over here H1 with the font family impact being applied and the backup font sans serif. And in fact, I can turn this off like this by unticking this box, which will return the heading to its default font style. Now, if I head over to Computed, I'm going to scroll to the bottom and you can see under Rendered Fonts, it says Family Name Impact. And this confirms the impact font is being applied. Let's check out what happens when I update the font to another family called Seeger UI. This font family has a 0% chance of being installed on my Mac. So I'll save this and refresh the page. So if we look again at rendered fonts, you can see the font family name is Helvetica. And that's being applied because my first preference font is not available in my system. So the font being applied is from the backup sans serif group. And the default backup font for sans serif on a Mac is Helvetica. Now this font isn't all that ugly. But if I go back to styles, and now remove this property and go back to computed. Now the font family being applied is times, which is just the default font of the browser, which isn't great. So it's really important to have a backup font group to avoid this happening. So let's now look at some font guidance. The key takeaway is to play it safe and pick a popular sans serif font. Sans serif fonts are a popular choice, especially for tech based applications that you're likely going to be working on. Let me show you some popular fonts that I would like to recommend. First up is Roboto, and on the right is a sample of how it looks. Open Sans is also very popular and looks super clean. Another classic option is Montserrat. Another option is Poppins, which is actually one of my favorite fonts, and we'll be using it in our Quill project. And finally, Inter is another popular option. These are just a few examples of some great sans serif fonts to consider. Now, in your projects, it's recommended to select one or two fonts, but no more. In this example, only one font is being used, which is Inter. The page looks nice, clean, and unified. Let's look at another example. Here, the heading uses Poppins. And then for smaller elements, like subheadings, the font Rubik is used. Mixing two fonts like this can really make your design pop with nice contrast. But remember, do not go more than two. Any more and your design starts to feel a bit overwhelming and you lose that cohesiveness. We'll finish up by talking about Google Fonts. Google Fonts are fonts that are available online and do not rely on the fonts installed on an individual user's device. These fonts live on the web, meaning they are not tied to your device at all, but are in the cloud. Google Fonts are very easy to add to your project and it is super straightforward. There are just three steps. First, you need to find the font you like. Next, you embed the font with a link tag in your HTML. And then the third step is you add the font into your CSS. So let's go see how this works. All right, so here's Google Fonts. The URL is just fonts.google.com. On the homepage, you're shown a list of fonts that are currently sorted by trending. So you can always come here to get some inspiration of which fonts to choose. You can then sort by other filters like most popular or newest. There's also additional filters over here, but you can filter by serif or sans serif and other classifications like display, handwriting, which is cursive or monospace. So let's go search one of the popular sans serif fonts I recommended earlier. Let's look for Inter. So you can see it appears here. So we click on the font. In the top right, we click Get Font, and then Get Embed Code so we can add it to our CSS. Now, before we embed it, there's a few criteria options we can select. At the moment, 
it's going to be importing all font weights from 100 to 900. If you wanted to, you could click one value and select a specific value you want to import. I'm just going to import them all. And you can also change the slant of the font. At the moment, the default is zero, which I'm just going to keep. So my font will just be normal without any slant. Now on the right over here, we have two windows, embed code in the head of your HTML and CSS class for a variable style. This top part here is what we're going to copy into the head section of our HTML to actually import the font. And this window over here is just showing us an example of how to use the font in CSS by declaring the font family property with the font family name inter and backup sans serif font. So let's copy this code and add it to our HTML. Now it's best practice to add this snippet of code before the link to our own style sheet. So I'm just going to paste it over here. This order ensures that font styles are loaded before our own custom styles. So the fonts that we're importing will load in app.css without any issues. Now this does look a little bit intimidating. So let's just briefly talk about what these different lines are doing. These first two lines are just for optimization purposes. And in theory, you don't actually need them, but it's best to leave them there just to ensure the fonts load in quickly. This third line is actually importing the font itself. You can see over here, family equals inter, and it's importing the weight 100 to 900. So let's go add this font in our CSS file. For the font family, I'm now gonna replace this font we added earlier with inter. I'm also just gonna add an H2 below so we can have a point of comparison to the default font in the browser. I'll just type default font. So let's check this out in the browser. So you can see the inter font has successfully been imported. And again, we can confirm that by opening up DevTools, selecting the element, going to the computed tab, and seeing the family name inter. And you can see this font is just way nicer than the default times font that comes in our browser. So let's finish up by starting to build out the next summary card, font family and color. We looked at what a typeface is. We saw that there were five primary groups of fonts. The first was a serif font. The next was a sans serif font. Then a monospace font, a cursive font, and a display font. We then looked at the CSS font family property, which looked like this. Font hyphen family, with a comma separated list of fonts where descending values were backups. And we always ended with a font family group like sans serif, which was the final backup. The font guidance we looked at was user popular sans serif font. So let's go ahead and add Google fonts to our Quill project. I've decided for this project, we're just going to be using a single font throughout the application. So our headings, paragraphs, anchor tags, and all other text will be in the font Poppins, which is one of my favorite sans serif typefaces. So let's head over to Google Fonts and grab the code to embed in our project. So I'm on the Google Fonts homepage, fonts.google.com. So I'm gonna go into the search bar and look for Poppins. I'll click it over here. I'll click Get Font. I'll click Get Embed Code. I'm not gonna play around with any of this criteria. I'm just gonna import all the different fonts in case we decide later in our project we want to use any. On the right over here, I'm just gonna copy all this code. All right, so I'm back inside our Quill project on the index.html page. I'm gonna go paste in the code we just copied earlier, and I'm gonna make sure to do it before my own custom style sheet app.css. I'm now gonna head over to app.css, and for each text element, I'm gonna add the font family property, set the value to Poppins, and provide a backup font of sans serif. I'm just gonna copy this line of code for all my headings, paragraph text, and anchor tag. All right, so let's check this out in the browser. All right, so this has made a massive difference. Using a popular sans serif font like Poppins really does start bringing the project to life. I also want you to notice how adding that minus two pixel letter spacing was the right decision. Now that we've added the font, you can see that our text has been tightened and the headings look like a nice cohesive unit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the huge benefit of using Google fonts is that they're stored in the cloud, which means that the fonts will always load in irrespective of what fonts are installed on the user's device.
Let's continue by adding visual impact to our text through the use of color. We'll be discussing name colors, color systems, the color property, and color palettes. All right, we're finally onto our last text property. Now it's time to look at my favorite CSS property, color. Just like size, color is used throughout CSS. So it's really important to get a good understanding of what it is and how it works. So let's first start with named colors. These are the colors we've been working with so far. CSS includes 147 named colors that browsers recognize. An example of a common color we've seen so far is red, and then there'll be some variation like salmon. We've got yellow, and a variation called khaki. There's blue, with a variation called aquamarine, and we've got green, with a variation called olive. Now, although we have been using these colors so far, these should not be used as they are very limited and not suitable for professional projects. This website, HTML Color Codes, shows you all the HTML name colors. So if you are interested, you can come here and check it out. So before we start looking at the CSS color property, we need to have a look at color systems. Color systems are a structured method for creating different colors using a set of primary colors and rules for mixing them. There are two main color systems. They are subtractive and additive. Let's look at the subtractive color system first. It's commonly used in print and painting, something many of us would have learned about in school. Let's take the CMY color system as an example. In this system, C stands for cyan, which is that blue color, M for magenta, which is that pinky color, and Y for yellow. This system starts with white and we apply colored pigments that absorb light. We start with a white canvas and add different colored pigments. The canvas absorbs the light from these paints and you get black when all the colors are mixed together. Now on the flip side, we have an additive color system. This is commonly used in electronic displays. The primary colors here are red, green, and blue, often abbreviated to RGB, a concept we'll look at soon. In additive color systems, we start with black and emit light at different intensities. Think about it, before your screen is on, it's black, and once it's on, it's emitting light at different intensities. When red, green, and blue are all combined at their maximum intensities, the result is white when all mixed. The additive color system is the complete opposite of the subtractive color system. Now in the context of CSS, we use an additive color system. It's because our colors are on a digital screen. I now want to go back to pixels, but this time we're going to be talking about color and not size. A pixel on your digital display is made up of red, green, and blue lights with adjustable intensities, which means we can tweak how bright each one shines. Over here, I have a digital display, and this square over here represents a pixel. Let's now zoom in on this pixel. What we would see are three panels of light, one red panel, one green panel, and one blue panel. These are the primary colors, red, green, and blue, we mentioned in the additive color system, and we call this RGB for short. RGB values range from zero, which is minimum intensity, to 255, which is maximum intensity. So for red, the intensity can go from zero to 255, for green, zero to 255, and for blue, 0 to 255. So for each color, there are 256 possible values, 0 being one of them. Now, if you are interested why there are 256 values, I've got a video in the link in the description below. I didn't want to include it in this video as the concept is a little bit more complicated and you really don't need to know why. But if you are interested, by all means, check it out. So let's go tinker with these values and have a look at an example. Imagine we set R to 152. It's a somewhat muted red. The green value to 116, and the blue value to 249, which is pretty close to the maximum. As a pixel is tiny, our eyes would mix these colors and would get purple. Looking at another example, setting R to 232, green to 202, and blue to nine, from a far distance, these colors would mix to yellow. So playing around with different RGB values gives you a whole spectrum of colors. An easy way to see the RGB value of different colors is to go to Google and type in color picker. 
and you get this widget at the top here. You can use this slider to go across the spectrum of colors, and then you can use your mouse to click a different tint or shade. And each time you click, you get a different RGB value. Now, you can see below here, the first listed color is this thing called hex. So what is that? So let's take a look at RGB and hexadecimal notation. Color values can be represented in either RGB or hexadecimal notation. As a disclaimer, there are other systems, but RGB and hexadecimal are by far the most common. So let's first look at RGB. In CSS, we'd represent an RGB value like this. We'd write RGB, and then inside the brackets, we'd have each value comma separated. The red value first, then the green, then the blue. This RGB value would produce this purple color. Let's now take a look at hexadecimal notation. This same RGB value can be written like this, which is in hexadecimal notation. We start with a hash, and then we have three sets of numbers and characters. In this case, 98, 74, and F9. This would produce the same color purple. Defining a color using the hexadecimal notation is actually more common than using RGB. So we're gonna be using it throughout this course. And this notation is used across CSS for specifying colors for text, backgrounds, borders, shadows, and more. Now, you might be thinking, what is this hexadecimal notation? RGB you may have heard of before, but hexadecimal might be completely new to you. I also have a separate video on this. Again, it's a little bit more complicated, and you don't technically need to know how it works. But if you are interested, the video goes through what hexadecimal is and the mathematics between converting between RGB to hexadecimal. It's not essential to know this, but if you are interested, the video is there. So looking back on the Google Color Picker, you can see that we have our RGB value and a corresponding hex value, which starts with the hash symbol and has three sets of letters and numbers, in this case, A1, 6D, and B3. So before we look at the CSS color property, we need to talk about shades of gray. When all three channels of RGB are set to the same value, we get a shade of gray. Let's take a look at this gray color here. It would have an RGB value of 64, 64, 64, and a corresponding hexadecimal value of hash 40, 40, 40, which gives us a dark gray. This gray color here, would have an RGB value of 136, 136, 136, with a corresponding hex value of 88, 88, 88. This lighter gray over here would have an RGB value of 192, 192, 192, and a corresponding hex value of C0, C0, C0. Let's have a look at the extremes now. To get black, we set all the RGB values to zero. And in hex notation, all the values are also zero. On the other extreme, we have white. This is when all the RGB values are 255. And in hex notation, all the values are F. So this means we have 256 values of gray to play with. I also just wanna show you something you may see sometimes, which is the shorthand for hexadecimal values. You'll see this shorthand when each pair of values in a hex code are the same. Let's take a look at an example. If the first pair is 22, the second pair is AA, and the third pair is 66. This can be shortened to 2A6. So for some of our shades of gray, we can use the shorthand as another way to represent them. For example, for black, each of the three sets has the same character of zero. So we can shorten this to 000. zero, zero. For the hex value where there are all eights, we can also shorten this to 888. And for white, where there's all Fs, we can shorten this to FFF. We can't shorten the 40, 40, 40, or the C0, 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 because for each pair, the character has to be the same. 4 and 0 is not the same, and C and 0 is not the same. It only worked for the others, because within each pair, the characters were the same. Now the shorthand notation is a neat trick, but it's not something to stress over. Most of the time, you'll be using full hexadecimal codes. It's just something I wanted to show you that existed, so that if you ever see three characters being used for a hexadecimal code instead of six, you know why. Let's now take a look at the CSS color property. The color property is used for specifying the color of text. Over here, you can see color is the property, 
And in this example, the hex code hash 9874F9 is the value. The values that we can use for color include RGB, hex, RGBA, and HSL. And as I mentioned earlier, hex is by far the most commonly used color system. But I do want you to be aware there are others. Now, the color property is specifically used on text. There are other properties like background color we'll be looking at later in the course, which as the name suggests, define background colors. And color values like the hex code you see on screen are often used throughout other CSS properties, like borders and shadows, CSS properties we will also look at later in the course. So for now, just know that the CSS property color is just for text. So let's jump into VS Code and play around with this. I've gone ahead and set up a new directory called color. Inside it, I have an index.html file where I've grabbed the boilerplate, and I've also linked a style sheet called app.css, which is currently empty. On index.html, let's grab an h1 and just give it the text heading one. And we'll just grab a paragraph and give it the text paragraph text. Inside app.css, I'm going to select the h1. I'll grab the color property. And let's start off with an RGB color. I'm just going to pick some random numbers between 0 and 255. So let's make the R 55, the G value 189, and the B value 110. So one of the nice features of VS Code is that it actually gives you a little sample of the color on the left of the property. And if I click on it, I can move around to get different tints and shades, and I can use this swatch to grab different colors. What's also really nice is if I come to the top here and click this, it toggles between different color systems. So let's go grab the hex color code. And I'm just going to change it to a bright green. So let's check this out in the browser. So as you can see, that bright green color has been applied to our H1. And I've just got this paragraph texture as reference to see the default color. And once again, I just want to drive home the message that the color property is only for text. For example, if I go add an input in our HTML and then try apply the color property to the input, I'll just pick the same color as before, you'll see nothing changes. And that's because this CSS property color only works for text. There are other properties we're going to be looking at later where we can change the background color of this input and even the border color. And you can actually see when I come into this input and start typing, the input text is green. Let's now look at some color guidance. The guidance I'll be going through now doesn't only apply to text, but as the web application as a whole. Now the rule of thumb is to have at least two colors in your color palette, a primary color and a gray color. Let's have a look at an example of a typical color palette. We'll start with the primary color. The first thing we do is choose a base color. In this case, it's this orange. The next thing you'll want to do is add tints. These are lighter shades of our base color and will look something like this. We also want to add shades, which is a darker version of our base color and will look something like this. We then add a gray color. Now the term gray is a bit confusing because it doesn't have to be a gray color. It can be a darker version of a color. So for example, the base gray color could be this dark purple. And again, we go and add tints, which are lighter versions of the gray color and shades, which are even darker versions of the base gray color. Let's take a look at this color palette in action. Primary colors are used to highlight important parts of a page and tints and shades can be used to create contrast. Here is the color palette we saw before being used on this page. You can see the call to action here, as well as this review icon are in the primary color. They're the more important components of this page. You'll also notice the background color of the page is a lighter orange. It's the primary tint being used, which creates a nice contrast, but still maintains that consistency with the color palette. Now the gray color, along with its tints and shades, is often used for fonts. You can see this main heading over here is in the gray base color, whereas a less important subheading, like the one over here, is in a gray tint. Also, color is used in images and illustrations for consistency. Taking a look at these company logos here, they're in gray tints and shades. And the main image over here is also in gray tints and shades. So color is used throughout the design for both components and sections. 
Scrolling down on the page, we have this section over here. You can see over here that the primary color is used in components, whereas the gray color is used in this section as a background. So you can see throughout the design, you can play around with the base primary and gray color, as well as their respective tints and shades to create a clean and unified design. Now, adding a secondary color introduces variety and contrast, often making designs more appealing. Let's go set up a new color palette. For our primary color, we're gonna use this blue base color with respective tints and shades. I'm gonna add a secondary color of this purple with respective tints and shades. And for the gray color, I'm gonna use a more traditional gray with its respective tints and shades. Let's check this color palette out in action. As we've seen before, primary colors are typically used on dominant elements such as buttons, background colors, and more. You'll notice the primary color is being used on icons, section headings, and buttons. And a primary tint is being used as a background. Secondary colors are used to add variety. Scrolling down the page, we have a very similar section, but now they're in the secondary color. We have the section heading and imagery in the secondary color. And again, the background color is using a secondary tint. Now you can also add tertiary colors. Tertiary colors add further variety. Looking at the same page again, we have this orange tertiary color being used as a section heading and in the icon. So let's now take a look at helpful resources which help you select colors. The first resource, which is my favorite, is called Open Color. It's this first link in Google over here. It basically gives you a gray color along with tints and shades, as well as common colors you'd use for primary, secondary, and tertiary colors, like red, pink, gray, violet, etc. From here, you can easily select your own base color, like blue four or five, and corresponding tints, like blue one and two, and shades, like blue seven and nine. This is one of my favorite resources because it really helps limit down color choices for you. The colors chosen here really are spectacular and beautiful and I would recommend using a resource like this so that you don't feel overwhelmed. Another popular resource is Tailwind Colors. So if I type Tailwind Colors and click on this link, I'm provided with a similar resource like Open Colors, but there's just a few more options. For example, you can see there's quite a few more options of gray colors, like slate, gray, zinc, neutral, etc. And there are a few more colors you can use for primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. It's basically Open Colors with a few more options. Tailwind is a very popular CSS framework we will be discussing later on in the course. If you want a bit more freedom to choose a color palette, a tool like Coolers is really popular. From the homepage, if I click Explore Trending Palettes, you can see that I'm given popular color palettes. So essentially, primary, secondary, tertiary, gray, etc. is selected for me. Now, if I wanted to use this color palette over here, I'd have to generate my own tints and shades. To do that, just head over to Google and search Tints and Shades Generator. I'll click on this first link over here, and all you do is copy the hex code, I'll grab this one, and paste it in here, and click Make Tints and Shades. You can see our base color over here, with shades becoming more intense as I move to the right, and this row is the tints, with the tint becoming more intense as I move to the right. So this is another option finding a color palette you like, and generating your own tints and shades. Now coming up soon, we're going to be adding colors to our Quill project. But before we do that, I'd like to quickly talk about brand guidelines. We'll be discussing this a lot more in the web design module of the Full Stack Bootcamp. Essentially, every product will have brand guidelines. It's usually a very detailed document containing rules about colors, sizing, logos, etc. I'm on the Duolingo brand guidelines. If I go to Identity and Color, you can see the primary colors that Duolingo use. Over here, we have the core brand colors, which are like the primary colors. There's secondary colors, and then there's neutrals, which is like the gray. They've even got a color palette for Duo, which is Duolingo's little owl mascot. Something that Duolingo do, as well as other companies, is give their colors distinguishable names, like Feather Green. These are colors Duolingo has just made up so that it's easy to refer to them. So let's go define quill colors. Where we'll set up the color palette we'll be using in our quill project. We'll first look at the primary color. I'll be adding a base color 
a tint and a shade. For the base primary color, I'm choosing this blue. I'm going to call this color sky blue, and it's got this hex code. All the tints and shades and all the other colors I'm going to be adding are from open color. So for the tint, I'm going to call it arctic, and it's got this hex code. For the shade, I'm going to call it deep sea, and it has this hex code. Looking at the secondary colors, the base secondary color I'm going to call lavender with this hex code, and it's this purple color. For the tint, I'm going to call moonlight iris with this hex code, which is a lighter version of that purple. And for the shade, I'm going to call it velvet night, which has this hex code, and it's a darker version of the purple. I'm going to also introduce a tertiary color. I'm going to call it pumpkin, which has this hex code, and it's an orange color. The tint I'm going to call Dawn with this hex code, which is a lighter version of this orange. And for the shade, I'm going to call it Lava with this hex code, and this is a darker version of the orange. For my gray color, I'm going to call it Slate, and it looks like this. For the tint, I'm going to call Pebble, which looks like this. And for the shade, I'm going to call Graphite, and it looks like this. So once again, I just got all these colors from Open Color. I selected a base color and chose a lighter version as my tint and darker version as my shade. Now, of course, you can add more tints and shades, but I want to keep this simple. And right now we have more than enough colors to work with. So let's wrap up by completing the summary card, font family and color. We looked at the CSS color property, which look like this. And we discussed different color values you can use like RGB hex, RGBA, and HSL. And I mentioned that hex is by far the most common color value to use. We then defined a color palette. We started with a primary color, where we defined a base color, sky blue, a secondary base color, lavender, a tertiary base color, pumpkin, and a gray base color, slate. We then added a tint of each of these, as well as a shade of each of these. And I simply grabbed each of these color values from my favorite tool, Open Color, where I picked a base color and one tint and one shade. The guidance we saw was have at least two colors, a primary and a gray with tints and shades of each. So a moment ago, we defined the color palette for our Quill project. So let's now go ahead and apply this color palette for different text elements. So let's now look at our Quill homepage and how we add these colors. The primary color is used in our logo, as well as our buttons. We have our secondary color being used as a highlight over here. The gray color is used for paragraph text, and the gray shade is being used for headings. Scrolling down the page, you can see the primary color is being used inside this illustration. We have the tertiary color being used as a highlight. The paragraph is in gray, and our headings are in a gray shade. Scrolling down to the bottom of the page, you can see our primary color is used as a background and is being used again as the logo in the footer here. The secondary color is being used on the button and it's being used for this little love heart down here. The gray color is being used for these hyperlinks and small piece of text at the bottom. And the gray shade is being used for the social media icons. Now, although we won't be coding this up in this section, I do want to show you the Quill's journal page. It's the dashboard that will list all our journals. The reason I want to show you this is because it uses other colors we've defined. For example, the background of the emoji is in a blue tint, and the border of each card is in a gray tint. So although we won't be using all the colors to the home page, a lot of them will come into play later. So let's jump into VS Code and add colors to text where we can. All right, so I'm back in the app.css file for our Quill project. So let's go add text color where we can. All of our headings use the gray shade, which I called graphite. I add this color by finding the color property and adding the hex value, which from my color palette was hash 212529. And you can see VS Code even gives us a sample of what that color looks like. I'm just gonna copy this color for all of my headings. For my paragraph, the color I used was the gray base color, which I called slate, and had the hex code 495057. This same color is used for my anchor tags, so I'll copy it and paste it over here. 
So let's check this out in the browser. So you can see our headings have this nice shade of gray, whereas paragraphs and anchor text are using this base gray color. As this project progresses, and we learn more about the box model and different selectors, we will start adding in our primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. In the final chapter, we'll consolidate all the properties we've looked at by starting to build a style guide. So throughout this topic, we've looked at a lot of different text properties. I'd like to specifically look at the properties we're using inside our Quill project. For styling, we're using font weight. For spacing, we're using line height and letter spacing. For family, font family. For color, color. And for size, font size. Now for each of these properties, in many cases, we've defined a whole range of values we're using in our project. The problem is we don't have one place where all these properties and values are listed for easy use as the project expands. Looking back at the Quill project in our app.css file, you can see our values are defined on different elements. But what we do need is a central location which just lists all the properties and values we've defined. For example, we've only set a handful of colors so far. We haven't even used our primary, secondary, or tertiary colors. So eventually, when we do need them, we should have them in a place that's easy to reach and not in some file at the back of a drawer. Now, many companies will have brand guidelines. In the previous chapter, we looked at Duolingo's brand guidelines. Just to show you another example, I have open here Slack's brand guidelines. Slack is a workplace messaging tool. Now, you can see it's very detailed. It's 50 pages long and covers items like brand values, persona, voice and tone, as well as important design elements, like how to use their logo, color guidance, typography, and more. In the web design section of the bootcamp, we'll be developing our own brand guidelines for the Quill project. But for now, what we need is a place just to list all our values and properties. So we're gonna add this all at the top of our CSS file. I'm gonna to come to the top here and make some space. The first thing I'm going to do is add a comment in CSS. Like with HTML, the shortcut for this on a Mac is command forward slash, and on a PC, control forward slash. So I'm going to go ahead and hit command forward slash on my Mac. And this is the syntax for a CSS comment. It starts with forward slash asterisk and ends with asterisk forward slash. Just like an HTML comment, this won't appear anywhere in the browser and is used internally for documentation and notes to self. I'm gonna create a multi-line comment by just hitting enter a couple times. For now, I'm gonna be adding two main categories of properties. The first is typography. I like to make main headings look like this. I add a few hyphens, put my heading all in caps, typography, and then end it with the same number of hyphens. The other main category we'll be adding is colors. So let's go through all the properties and values one by one and add them up here. On the right, I've selected slides from the last few chapters where I've listed the property and values we're using. Starting with font sizes, I'm gonna add a heading all in caps like this. To keep this concise, I'm gonna add all the font sizes on a single line separated by a forward slash. The first value is 12 pixels, then 16 pixels, 20 pixels, 24 pixels, 32 pixels, 40 pixels, 48 pixels, and 62 pixels. The next property are different font weights. We're using 400 and 700. Next up, it's line heights. The values we've defined are 1.2 and 1.5. Next, it's letter spacing, and the values we have are zero and minus two pixels. I'm putting zero here as a value because this is just the default value. On an element like a paragraph, we're not adding any letter spacing. So this will just have the default value for letter spacing, which is zero. The final typography value is font family. And in our project, we're using Poppins. All right, moving on to colors. I'm gonna now add our primary, secondary, tertiary, and gray colors. Starting with the primary. Our base primary color has a hex code of 339AF0 and we call this sky blue. Our primary tint has a hex code of D0EBFF, and we call this Arctic. 
And our primary shade has a hex code of 1C7ED6. And we call this deep C. Now, to avoid boring you, I'm just going to go add the base tint and shades for our secondary, tertiary, and gray colors. All right, you can see that they're in now. So what we've now ended up with is an easy to reach central location, which has important properties and values that we can pull from anytime as the project expands. At the moment, we just have typography and colors. And as we move through the CSS section, we will be adding other headings containing more properties and values. You're smashing it. We've now finished CSS text. In the next topic, we'll be diving deep into CSS selectors, where we'll learn how to target and style specific elements on your web page efficiently. Also, make sure to subscribe to the channel to stay in the loop with new releases. See you in the next video.